The used car market is absolutely brutal for anybody who's wanting to buy a used car. But just because the used car market is tough doesn't mean it's impossible to find solid deals. Though finding those good deals is only half the battle because once you find the car that you're interested in buying, you then have to inspect that car to make sure it's a good car to buy. A couple of weeks ago, I made a video talking about how I find all of the used cars that I buy. And in that video, I broke down my entire process of navigating online marketplaces so that I can find below market value cars. In that video, I broke down why I choose Facebook over Craigslist, what I look for in vehicles, the research that I do beforehand, how I find good prices, and what I look for in the actual vehicle listing. But as I mentioned just a moment ago, finding that car is only half the battle. And I would probably argue it's the easier battle to fight. The harder battle is actually inspecting that car for purchase to make sure that it's a viable vehicle for you. Inspecting a car that you're interested in purchasing is so incredibly important. It can truly be the difference between buying a dud of a vehicle that you're going to have to invest a ton of money into versus buying one that could be the perfect car for you. Inspections can truly make or break the car buying experience and knowing what to look for and the red flags to keep an eye on can really set you up for success in the long term. So with the help of my fiance and business partner HP, we're going to take you through our exact process now. So let's first take a look at the exterior. Of course, the exterior of the car is mainly aesthetic with a hint of functionality as well. Whenever I look at exterior of vehicles, I'm going to be looking for the quality of paint. Is the paint chipping? Is it peeling? Is it fading? Does it look as though the car was recently repaired or recently in an accident? Are panels of the vehicle aligned or falling apart? Just overall, what is the general condition of the exterior of the car? One key thing that you will want to look at whenever you're looking at the exterior, especially from a like upkeep and functionality standpoint is rust. So you'll want to look at the undercarriage of the car as well as around the nooks and crannies of the vehicle as well to ensure that there isn't rust that could sneak up on you and cause a lot of issues later on down the road. So when looking at the exterior of your car, things like dents and dings and scratches, things that you chalked up to normal wear and tear don't really matter. It's a used car after all. The big things you're going to be looking for are panels that are severely damaged or that can't really easily be replaced. Now this car does not have a lot of issues, which is kind of one of the reasons why we bought it, but there are some things that kind of stand out. Like this one right here, it's a small rock chip, not a big deal. But if you look at an angle, you can see that this car does have a fair amount of dents indicating it's had prior hail damage. Not bad, we'll get into why that's important later when we look at the interior of the vehicle. But exterior, cosmetically, it's pretty fine. One thing you do want to pay attention for are things like panel gap. Do you have bigger gaps on the opposite side? So we can see here, the hood looks pretty good and uniform. And then we look on this side and it actually matches up. The reason why you're looking for stuff like this is because when parts are replaced on a vehicle or when they're removed to be painted or repaired, they often have a bigger gap and not a lot of attention to detail when they were put back on was made. So it's really important to see if they're hiding damage, if the car is known to not have any issues, take a look and get, use your best judgment as to whether or not maybe it has had an accident before. Now, one of the key things you always want to look for is going to be rust. Now, down here in Texas, you're not going to have a lot of vehicles with rust, but depending on the history of the vehicle, it might have it. Now, looking down here on this fender area, this is usually where you're going to see a lot of the rust happen. Water splashes or salt and grime ends up accumulating in some of the fender wells and can start rotting out your fenders and even lower down here on your rocker panels or side skirts. So, looking here, this car looks pretty solid. Let's go to the back. Yeah, also looking down here, no issues with any rust. Typically you can look inside the wheel well, maybe look at some suspension components and see some variations of rust that might be forming. Surface rust is okay. When you start seeing flake apart, that's when it's an issue. While we're on to the exterior, let's also look at tires as well. Whenever it comes to looking at the tires, we like to look at things like are the tires all the same type and size of tires? One thing that is very common in the world of reselling vehicles is sellers basically mismatching the car with different tires in the most cost-effective way. This is fine for the purpose of selling the car, but if you're a buyer, it's definitely something you'll want to be aware of because it can affect the life of the tires. Now looking at the exterior of a vehicle, the next thing you want to check is going to be the tires. Now you can use a fancy tread depth checker, which you can get at any local auto parts store, or you can simply use a penny, and this is the best way to gauge how the condition of the tire is. So looking at the outside tread depth of the tire, we're going to be reading right about 5 to 6 30 seconds. The middle is going to come right about 7 30 seconds and the very inside is going to come right about 5 30 seconds of tread. 
to get an actual number on the tread depth, always use the lowest number that you end up recording on your tread depth finder. If you don't have one of these, simply using a penny is the best way to judge it. In most states, if you can see the top of Lincoln's head, then it's done. The tire is right about 230 seconds of tread depth and it's not safe to drive on after that. Now looking at the tire, you can find when the tire is manufactured. 25th week of 2021. Usually you'll see it says DOT, which is date of tire. This is all the manufacturing info. And then typically what I like to call almost in parentheses is the week and year of the tire itself. Now there is no actual expiration date of tires, but the general rule of thumb is to make sure that your tires are at least five years old or newer. Anything past that is susceptible to dry rotting or some deep cracking and the tire may not be safe to drive on. Now let's move on to the interior of the vehicle. And whenever I'm inside of the car, I wanna look at a few different things. Number one is how is the condition of the interior? Are there any stains, scratches, tears? And if so, are these things that can be easily cleaned or replaced? Additionally, I'll also want to open and play with basically every button and latch in the interior to make sure that everything is functioning properly. So opening up things like the glove compartment, the center console, playing around with the door latch, playing around with the AC vents, making sure that everything is attached properly, turning on the interior dome lights, just making sure that everything is working as it should. And again, if things are not working as it should, how easy will it be to replace these things? And one key thing that HP and I always do in the interior vehicles is we will also feel the floorboards as well. Damp floorboards or floorboards that look like they're water stained, this can be indicative of a car being a flood car, which is a big, big red flag. Now moving on to the interior of the vehicle, I like to be like a little kid and touch absolutely every single button or object that I can press or push. It's a vehicle. It should function the way it's came from the factory, right? So I always check for absolutely everything, make sure everything works, everything from sun visors all the way down to air vents, see if anything is broken, that is the number one thing. Now moving on to seats, when you start looking at seats and you see scratches or tears or anything, you can typically chalk it up to normal tear, wear and tear, but when you start seeing major things like rips and seams coming apart in the seats, that can be a pretty indication of how the vehicle is treated overall. Now when you're looking at carpets, this is really important. You want to pull back your floor mats and you want to feel for any dampness on the floor mats themselves. Starting at the front is usually the best way to go and then you're going to move on to the back of the vehicle. The reason why you want to move on to the back of the vehicle is that typically water will start pooling up in the lowest areas, which is usually the back seat or even the trunk area. Now looking in the back seat, if you can pull up the back seat, if it's meant to pull up, then pull it up and check underneath there. If you can't, you want to go to the lowest point, which in this case is going to be the floor back here, and you're going to feel in these pockets, really get in there and make sure if you feel any dampness. If it's clean and it's wet, they probably just recondition it to make it look nice and pretty for you. But if it's dirty and wet, that's probably an indication that you have a severe leak where something has happened in the past that has caused water to get in here, like hail damage or flood damage. Lastly, arguably one of the most important places that I check for wetness is going to be in the spare tire area. Most places there's nothing lower. So underneath here we can see that there's no water ring marks where water has pulled up or dried out from here. That's really important to check because this is truly the lowest spot. This is where a lot of water will end up coming. After we check out the interior, it's time to pop the hood and it's time to do a preliminary mechanical inspection of the vehicle. Number one thing you're going to want to start off is look at the actual vehicle itself and see if you see anything wet. Now this car has not been serviced recently, maybe in the past thousand miles possibly, but other than that, there's no major fluids anywhere. Everything pretty seems dry and a little bit dusty and that is okay. What you're gonna wanna look out for is pulling up of some areas where fluid has either you know overflowed out of the area or it's been leaking out of. Seeps are okay. The difference between a leak and a seep is the seep is just gonna be a little, maybe a little wet around that area, but a leak is where you're gonna see actual pooling or droplets of fluid. That's when it's a problem. Now looking at the condition of fluid, brake fluid and like most other fluids, the cleaner the better, but it's a used vehicle you're looking at. So looking at here, we can see the fluid is an extremely dark, which is usually a good sign. This hasn't been replaced before the fluid condition is just good. Now this is important to look at. A lot of people think that fluids are supposed to be clean or they're supposed to be dirty. I personally like to see dirtier or average used fluids. It's a used car after all. If you start seeing a lot of fluids that have been you know, recently replaced and they're nice and clean, that might raise a question because why are they doing that? Did they just repair something or even worse, are they just adding fluids because it's leaking out the bottom? Now most vehicles will have a ATF fluid or automatic transmission fluid. 
dipstick. Now, if you don't have one on a vehicle, that's usually not a major issue, but if you have one, be sure to check it. Now, on transmission fluids, you're not always gonna get an accurate reading of how much is in there, but we're looking for fluid color. This is important on the transmission fluid. So as we can see, it's almost like a little bit of a reddish brown, and that is okay. When you're looking at transmission fluid, you wanna make sure the fluid isn't black. If it's black or it's unusually dark, give it a smell. If it smells like real burning or you know just really overcooked, that's usually indicative of some transmission problems. Or if you see a gray metallic-y, it's almost silvery like glitter, that's not a good transmission. But if you see fluid that's a reddish brown, that's the color it's supposed to be. It's not gonna smell good, but as long as it doesn't smell burnt, you're good. Now looking at engine oil is really important. Engine oil is on average supposed to be replaced every 3,000 to 5,000 miles, so it shouldn't always be extremely black. If it's extremely black, that's not good. But if it's like a brownish, dirty brown, that's okay. It's pretty normal of a vehicle to have you know, dark oil. It's just been used. Now looking at the dipstick, usually yellow, I'm gonna go ahead and pull that out. You wanna give it a first wipe just to check the color. Color looks good. As we can see, it's almost a golden brown. Like I said, I did this about 1,000 miles ago place it all the way back in there. The vehicle was just recently started, so this is good. I wanna see exactly how much oil's in there. And looking at the top notch, this is topped off perfectly exactly where it should be. Now, if you start noticing that the fluid is clean, but it's low on the dipstick line after you wiped it, then you probably have a leaky you know, oil pan or something that's not good. But if you find that it's almost in the middle of the crosshairs, that's good. If you find that it's low and dirty, it probably needs to be changed, but I'd be wary because it shouldn't be eating that much oil. Now looking at the oil fill cap, this is where you want to take a look on the inside. Now what we're looking for here is black sludge, and that's exactly what it means. If you see any black in there, almost like it's caked up, like almost the bottom of a brownie pan, that's when you want to step away from a vehicle and say, okay, this car has not had its oil changes regularly enough to keep that black sludge away. It's been caked up. That could be indicative of future engine failure. You're just looking for black sludge. If you see a little bit here and there and the car has a lot of miles, it might be normal. But if you see a lot, walk away. Now lastly, there are two places to check coolant. If the car is hot, do not open up the silver radiator cap, you'll burn yourself. You wanna look for the coolant reservoir. Now we can see in here that the coolant, it is filled and I can attest for you, unless you can really get in there or get a flashlight, you're looking at the color. If it's really dark and dirty, probably needs to be changed, but if it starts looking gray, that means that oil has usually mixed with water. And if you know anything about cooking, oil does not mix with water very well. And if it starts getting gray and gross like that, it might have some serious engine issues, and only if you find that in the coolant reservoir. All right, now lastly, you're gonna get a little bit dirty. You're just gonna be on the ground. We're looking underneath the vehicle. We wanna see if you know fluids that have leaked down have made it to the bottom. That's how you know if your car has leaks or seeps. So looking underneath here, everything is nice and clean. There's not really a lot of dirt underneath here. I have my note from when I changed the oil and there might be a little bit of dirtiness right there, but other than that, that's just a seep. I don't see any wetness and everything looks pretty dry. All fluids ultimately end up going to the bottom of the vehicle, especially when they get hot. You wanna see if you see a lot of fluid pulling down there. If you do, the car probably has some serious engine leaks somewhere, needs to be addressed. Now when it's time to start up the car, you wanna see if you can get the car cold. In most case scenarios, most problems will occur when the vehicle is cold. And you wanna see the starting condition. How fast does it start up? Does it start up nice and easy? And do you hear any squeaks or big clanks whenever you start the vehicle? Starts right up. Now the outside of the vehicle, we can hear there's no excessive clicking or ticking, no knocking, no shimmying. The car sounds pretty balanced, which is what you wanna hear. When you start hearing a lot of noises, it's usually not the best sign. Now some cars may be louder than others, you have to take that with a grain of salt, but if you hear something or something doesn't sound right, do a little bit of investigating, maybe see where it's coming from, or maybe ask the person you're buying from it what that noise is. Then of course, once all of this has been checked off, we will move on to the most important part of the inspection, which is the actual test drive. Now whenever HP and I do these test drives for our cars, we each have our own assigned roles. HP always is the one who's driving, and he's really feeling out the driving experience of the car. So how does the car feel as it's 
driving? Does it stutter during acceleration? Does it brake okay? Does the steering wheel shake? What is the car doing as it's being driven? And what I'll do from the passenger seat is I will basically play with every single button that is inside of this vehicle. I'll turn up the AC, I'll turn it down, I'll roll down the windows, I'll lock the doors, I'll turn on the radio, does every single channel play? And simultaneously, as we're both doing our own roles, we will also both listen out for noises, odd rattlings, odd smells, odd feelings in the vehicle to make sure that the car is operating as it should. So whenever HP and I are doing our test drive, my job is to really touch everything, to make sure that everything is working properly, windows are rolling down, windows are rolling up, turning on the AC, turning off the AC, turning on the heater, doing the unlock and lock, really just making sure that everything is working as it should. Now, whenever I'm driving, my goal is to focus on the functionality of the car itself. I'm listening for everything. If I hit a bump of the road, does the car start making a different noise? If I'm accelerating, does the car make any rattling or shaking? Or when I'm braking, does the steering wheel start shaking? Or when I'm up to speed, am I feeling vibrations in the pedals? Or am I feeling vibrations in the seat? This is all really important because a lot of that is actually gonna dictate what may be wrong with the vehicle. Worn suspension components, unbalanced wheels, or even a faulty alignment in a lot of the cases. So at slow speeds, when you're working your way to a faster road, you wanna really listen for a lot of stuff because when you get to higher speeds, you may not be able to hear a lot of it over the road noise. Now, when Aubrey's doing her checks and checking things like AC, you wanna see does the AC turn on quick and how cold is the AC? The second thing you wanna do is the heater. Does the heater also turn to the heat side very quickly and is it really producing a lot of heat? Now when we're driving, we also want to pay attention to as much as we can on the gauge cluster. If you have gauges that show things like battery voltage or coolant temperature or even oil pressure, these are all things you want to look for and make sure everything reads in the normal area. Now once you're on a real road, you want to do a couple of things like an acceleration test. You want to make sure the car can get up to speed appropriately. Now, only being at 40 miles an hour, everything checks out fine. The gearbox shifted exactly how it should. It didn't drag out a gear extremely long. Now that I've come into a red light, I'm gonna go ahead and brake a little harder. Brace for braking. <laughs> now this car does have analog braking system and it did kick on exactly like it should. It didn't lock up the tires, which means the brakes feel pretty good. And I didn't feel any wobbling in the steering wheel either. When you slam on your brakes, your brakes shouldn't be pulling to one side or the other, and they also shouldn't be shaking the steering wheel, indicating warped front rotors. Now, in most cases, when I'm doing a test drive, I want to try to get to a highway or maybe a service road next to a highway to really get it to higher speeds. Sometimes a lot of problems aren't heard until you get to the highway speeds, 55, 60, 70 miles an hour in some cases. Now when you're driving, if you notice that the car is pulling to left or to the right, it could just be normal wear and tear. It also could be worn suspension components. So that's something to look out for if you didn't already check underneath the vehicle and seen any real big impact damage or scrapes underneath the vehicle. Now, this isn't a deal breaker if the car is pulling left and right. Most alignments can be done anywhere from $80 to $150 depending on the vehicle and where you take it. But it is a good negotiating tool. Now, most of your driving, when you're doing your test drive, I like to leave around five or 10 minutes at least in order on a test drive. That usually shows that the car can get up to a normal operating temperature. And if you're going at slower speeds, that works to your benefit. The car isn't gonna overheat at slower speeds because it's not getting a lot of airflow. The car should be driving normal at lower speeds and driving normal at higher speeds, you want both. Now normally after 10 minutes of driving, you're gonna be able to start smelling. Now smelling is a really useful tool, especially when you're driving a car for a good amount of time. You wanna smell for any burning. Does the car smell sweet like coolant? Coolant, whenever it starts leaking out, smells really sweet, especially when it gets warm. And also exhaust smell. Does the exhaust smell really fuel and smell? That could also be a sign that the catalytic converter may be not doing a good job also. Now, at the end of your test drive, which was hopefully about 10 minutes, you're gonna wanna go ahead and park the car and get out and do one final overlook. Be sure to leave the car running. This is also a prime opportunity to see that after a drive, can the car keep itself cool when idling? Is it gonna overheat? This is also good to be able to smell everything from the outside, not just the inside of the vehicle, and do one final walk around and make sure that this is the car that you wanna buy. Remember, all sales are final when you're doing a private purchase or at a dealership. More than likely, they're not gonna to wanna to take that vehicle back, especially when they have your cash. 
And at this point in the inspection, once we've gone through all of these different steps, we should have a pretty good idea if this is a car that's worth buying. And if a car does have issues, we should have a pretty decent idea of what these issues are. Now, whenever you're buying a car in the used car market space, it's very, very common to find cars that are far from perfect, cars that need a little bit of mechanical work, cars that have some cosmetic issues, and that is something that is totally okay. So oftentimes, whenever HP and I are looking at these cars, if it's a small cosmetic issue that we don't feel the need, that it needs to get fixed at all, then we won't even worry about it. But if it's something a little bit more severe, either on the cosmetic side or on the mechanical side, we will oftentimes research while we have the car on a test drive, how much it will cost this car to fix. So for example, if a car has a damaged front fender, we will oftentimes go onto eBay really quickly, see how much it will cost to get us that exact same fender, and then we will count that into the price that we're wanting to pay for this car. If for example, we take a car on a test drive and we notice a noise, we will oftentimes try to diagnose that while we have the car, that way we can figure out if it's something that's a deal breaker. I would say one key thing that you should always bring with you whenever you go into these inspections is an OBD2 port scanner. The OBD2 port scanner is an incredibly valuable tool. It really lets you see behind the curtains of how that car is operating and any issues that it could potentially have. And it's something that could save you thousands of dollars and it can help you avoid a major issue. But like always, you guys, if you have any questions, comments, if you have anything to add, I would love to hear it. So make sure to leave a comment down below. And while you guys are at it, make sure to hit the like button, hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell. And I'll see you guys in the next video.